I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ethan Shaler, who is a mechanical engineer at JPL. Dr. Shaler's background spans a variety of domains. He has a PhD in electrical engineering, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and a master's in micro and nanotechnologies. How cool is that? Dr. Shaler collaborates with researchers in a variety of disciplines to design, build, and test robotic systems from micrometer to meter scale. In the past, he's made flexible grippers, miniature legged robots, and high voltage actuators. Dr. Shaler is also part of the NIAC, NASA Advanced Innovative Advanced Concepts. The NIAC program is a highly competitive program that nurtures visionary ideas that could transform uh, NASA missions in the creation of breakthrough, radically better, and entirely new aerospace concepts. Dr. Nayak's projects are FLOAT, a levitating transport system for the moon, and SWIM, a swarm of miniature underwater robots for ocean world. Dr. Shaler spends most of his time on work related to the Mars 2020 rover, leading a team providing data, trending, and long-term performance analysis of the rover sampling and catching subsystem. He is also now training to become a Mars 2020 rover planner. He is also one of the few lucky people to touch the Perseverance rover before flight during one of the training procedures. So if you wonder why the Perseverance works so well, maybe that's what helps. <laughs> So before we start the presentation, I would like to remind everyone that we will be taking questions at the end. Dr. Shaler, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's a full house. Um, thank you very much for that great introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I'm Ethan Shaler, and I'll be discussing uh, my two research tasks for NIAC, float and swim, and more broadly, how I see that novel mesoscale robots might one day operate in the extreme lunar and ocean world environments. So let's jump right in. Um, the overarching question for this work is, what are mesoscale robots, and how are they useful for aerospace missions? And for those who don't know, meso or intermediate scale robots are typically centimeter to decimeter scale robots, typically with micro uh, scale components. So they bridge that gap between centimeter scale true micro robots and more conventional meter scale macro robots. And they often have uh, manufacturing techniques that incorporate uh, both micro machining in clean rooms and more conventional machining or 3D printing um, technologies. And I like to think personally uh, that mesoscale robots are the smallest robots you can actually build and fix with your own two hands. Um, and in my mind, they're also the smallest mobile robots that are capable of performing what I'll term useful activities in the real world. Um, so getting out of the laboratory environment and doing something with a purpose. Um, and they provide advantages in size or mass constrained applications, which are very relevant for, for aerospace missions, um, but they often sacrifice capabilities in some way. So whether that's your sensing or intelligence, your communication range, your actual lifespan, um, something is going to, by necessity, be less capable than a, a larger conventional robot. Um, and just to kind of highlight three different areas here, these images, you know, coming out of the lab I was actually in for grad school, though not my own work, um, colleagues of mine developed both uh, ornithopters, so flapping wing flyers, legged running robots. We have a, a one-legged jumping robot called Salto, which is really cool. And then um, out of Harvard, there are some small uh, fish-inspired swimming robots. So these are all in this kind of mesoscale uh, where they're exemplifying specific mobile mobility uh, systems and, and you know, usually performing some interesting capabilities. Um, my own research background um, is in miniature grippers, actuators, and robots. And, and shown at the top here are some of the kinds of things I've worked on. We have uh, a flexible gripper that could grab uh, MLI, the multi-layer insulation on satellites. Um, and uses high voltage electrostatic adhesion and gecko adhesive to do that. And also I have this um, you know, centimeter scale electrostatic inchworm robot. So very tiny, flexible robots, um, interesting technologies sort of underlie them. Um, but NASA and JPL are much more known for their meter scale, highly sophisticated 
extremely robust spacecraft and robots. So you know, I've shown here the, the Perseverance robot. This is actually me in the, the clean room during assembly, so amazing experience on its own right. Um, but very different from mesoscale robots. And so the question on my mind throughout the past few years has really been, are there aerospace missions where these mesoscale robots are not just feasible, but actually the best solution to perform engineering or science tasks in extreme environments? And I'm not the only one thinking about this. Um, for space, people have thought about this for a while, and the answer is yes, we have CubeSats, right? They're, they're being more and more capable. We've sent them to Mars with Marco. Capstone's headed to the moon right now. Um, they're great. Um, for flying robots, Ingenuity uh, is perhaps what I would say on the upper end of what I'd consider a mesoscale robot, right? The, the blades are actually over a meter long, but, but you do have small packaged electronics in there, um, and it's been performing amazingly well on, on Mars. Um, when we start to think about moon and ocean worlds, um, float may, sh may show some promise for mesoscale robots on the moon, and swim is one way we could send them to, to ocean worlds. So as was briefly alluded, let's, let's talk about what they are. So float is, a, is flexible levitation on a track, um, and it's a concept for the first lunar railway system consisting of hundreds or thousands of meter scale magnetic robots that passively levitate with no power um, and, and move controllably over a flexible film track. And they can transport hundreds of thousands of kilograms of payload daily. Uh, that's at least our goal. <laughs> um, and then for swim, or sensing with independent micro swimmers, um, that's a concept for using dozens of miniature, untethered, underwater robots to explore the ice-ocean interface on ocean worlds like Europa or Enceladus and characterize their physical and chemical properties in search of science for extant life. We already got a, a brief intro of what the NIAC or NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts is, so I don't actually need to touch on this too much, but I'll just say that you know, these are technologies that are exceptionally low technology readiness level, or TRL, and they're, they're concepts that may never be realized for decades, if at all, but we're really trying to push the bounds on, on what's capable in these sort of uh, missions. And we're specifically, in this case, focusing on feasible designs for mesoscale robots that are based on capabilities of existing terrestrial robots, but we're distilling them down into the smallest, simplest robots that are still capable of performing NASA missions in unique corners of the solar system. So with that lengthy intro, uh, let's jump into float. <laughs> and um, this is a collaboration between folks at JPL, SRI International, and Pellerine Innovations. And I'll actually note that uh, we have a paper coming out later this month at Mars, or Manipulation, Automation, and Robotics at Small Scales. So, um, some of this work is, is going to be shown there as well. Now, why do we need float? Well, as part of the Artemis program and the Moon to Mars plans, NASA's goal is to establish permanent, sustainable lunar bases in the coming decades. And there are a number of mission architectures for lunar bases that have been developed over the past 50 plus years, but they all require transporting tons of material in one form or another across the lunar surface. And we've opted in this case to focus on the Robotic Lunar Surface Operations 2, or RLSO2 mission concept, uh, which focuses on a human-tended base around the Shackleton Crater at the Lunar South Pole, and a robust water ice mining operation that yields about 1,000 kilograms of water daily. And that's intended to support both base consumables for astronauts and rocket fuel for multiple launches a year. And shown in, in the figure here are three different base layouts. Um, and, and written down here are kind of the, the necessary payload transport requirements, both in terms of, of volume and distance for each of these uh, different base layouts. And the first one places the base in a, just inside the crater near our regolith mines and requires transporting quite a lot of raw regolith uh, to a refining facility. Um, the second option places the base uh, up here outside the crater and requires transporting regolith that's refined partially um, by robots in the field 10 kilometers up and out of the crater per day for processing, which is quite a feat in of its own, right? Um, and the final option is that we would extract and refine water in the field and transport only the resulting 1,000 kilos back to the base. Um, and while the RLSO2 concept proposed several different vehicle uh, options that could perform both resource extraction and transportation, we initially took a broader view of what those options might be and looked at in this case, rovers, flyers, trains, cableways, uh, and then float is our kind of ultralight rail alternative. And what we found was that most existing robots use motor-powered wheels, some had legs or tracks for mobility, um, and all of those are gonna actively loft your abrasive lunar dust, and it plays a big role in, in limiting your operational life. 
We also know, at least today, that autonomous driving on unstructured terrain is slow, computationally intensive, and prone to faults that require human intervention. So it's no easy feat. Um, and other potential solutions, such as trains or cable systems, are typically very efficient, reliable, and low maintenance. And we use them very commonly on Earth for, for large payload transport. But they have significant infrastructure requirements. So we view float as a low infrastructure, low mass alternative to these more conventional road, rail, or cable systems. And we believe that using float for some long distance transportation applications can actually free some of these more sophisticated robots to do the, in, in this case, heavy lift construction uh, or, or regolith mining, rather than having to have them just spend most of their time transporting regolith around the moon. So what exactly is float? Well, um, here's a concept art that we had made for float. Um, float is, our vision for what a lunar railway system might be, and it would re provide reliable, autonomous, and efficient payload transport on the moon. And while we aim to move hundreds of thousands of kilos per day over multiple kilometers, we would do this by deploying tens or thousands of unpowered, individually controllable, meter scale levitating magnetic robots over a flexible track that can be rolled directly onto the lunar regolith. And that's sort of a cutaway of it shown here. Um, our float robots would perform the essential but repetitive transportation tasks between a lunar base, in situ resource mining and refining sites, lunar landers and other outposts. And they would have the added benefit, as I mentioned, of reducing transportation demands on more high value lunar vehicles, such as the mining robots. Um, and shown here are, are t is an example of, and this surface here is actually a, a piece of graphite. Um, but they're, they're magnets actually levitating over that surface. And you can see that's the mirror image below, um, just to get a, a sense of how this technology might look on Earth. Um, and, and our colleagues have actually, in this case, done basically micro manufacturing and assembly of a truss structure using these very small robots. And, and that was a quick intro, but I'll, I'll show a nice little video here. Um, we didn't come up with the idea for float in a vacuum. It was instead built on um, our collaborators at SRI's di diamagnetic micromanipulation technology. And they've been building this over many years. And what you can see is that these are very versatile little robots um, operating in very cool ways. They can operate with large parallelism. Um, but on Earth, they're typically limited to operating at millimeter scale robots on centimeter scale tracks in a clean, controlled laboratory environment. Um, and you, know, you can see it moving around even on a flexible surface here. And actually, uh, seeing this video is, is what the inspiration for Float was, um, along with a, a chat with these folks at a conference. Um, so I'll just add that on the moon, we think we can improve the payload capacity by more than 10x per unit area just by reducing gravity. So that alone makes a huge difference for us. Um, but we also need to scale this technology up by about three orders of magnitude. Uh, to use meter scale robots and kilometer, kilometer scale tracks. And that all needs to still retain, retain that very small magnetic length scale, so those kind of sub-millimeter levitation heights um, that are necessary for diamagnetic levitation. And so a major question for us when we're thinking about this whole project is, is this even possible? <laughs> um, and, you know, there are a lot of challenges, you know. We, uh, we want to provide autonomous, reliable payload transport across multiple kilometers of lunar terrain. And if that's not challenging enough, we also need to contend with large payload requirements, uh, minimal site preparation, minimal infrastructure or fabrication repair, unless we ship it all the way from Earth. And we have to work in a truly inhospitable environment. Um, the temperatures can range by hundreds of degrees Celsius. We're exposed to radiation. We have abrasive regolith that chews through mechanism life. It's, it's a really terrible place to run robots. <laughs> um, but what we saw with with existing lunar base transportation concepts, and as I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that they all either require significant site preparation and substantial infrastructure, or we're consuming operational life with mechanisms that can fail um, in this environment. And so the innovation we had for Float was devising a very simple robot that consists of just an array of permanent magnets, and those permanent magnets will passively levitate over a flexible track using diamagnetic levitation. And this is similar to maglev trains you might see on Earth, but those all typically use superconducting magnets that use a ton of power or refrigerant to actually keep everything cool enough to work. Diamagnetic levitation, uh, which is a, or diamagnetism, which is a property of certain materials, 
um, whereby they generate a magnetic field that opposes an externally applied magnetic field, such as one you'd see in a, in a permanent magnet. And it does that all passively, and it works at room temperature. Um, and it's not as strong of a force as you would see with, with a superconducting magnet setup, but it works at really any of the temperatures we might see on the moon. So in the float track, we take advantage of, uh, and you can see sort of a, a cross-section illustration here, um, we take advantage of graphite's diamagnetic properties to repel the permanent magnets in the robots. And this allows us to passively levitate these robots with no moving parts or electricity, and yet they can still support on the order of 30 kilograms per meter squared of payload on the moon. Um, and by adding flexible, energizable circuit layers, and that's shown kind of here, to the track, we can actually generate electromagnetic forces that will controllably move these magnetic robots on the surface. Um, so we get passive levitation, but active motion. Now, because the tracks are flexible, we can actually unroll them directly onto the lunar regolith, so we don't need to do major construction like you might see with a railroad. And finally, we think maybe, this is, this is the further out bit, but we think we could add a thin film solar panel to the surface, and then you might actually be able to generate net positive power as you're rolling these out on the moon, and, and they're in sunlight. So, we talked a lot about, about all the challenges and, and you know, how might we actually get there. Well, we think that the float concept can be feasible if we can demonstrate a few things. If we can show that scaling robots will give us greater payloads, since our current centimeter scale robots are kind of milligram scale payloads. Um, we also need to show that compliant robots are gonna work uh, on non-flat tracks, because the moon is anything if not flat. There are craters, there are hills, there are rocks. Um, we, we can't just imagine a perfectly paved road for us. Um, or we'd use other types of robots. Um, and especially since our current robots levitated about 70 to 100 microns over the track, we really need to understand how well we can conform to a non-flat surface. Um, and then finally, we also need to worry about wear. So can we ensure that there's minimal wear when we're operating on these dirty tracks? Because we know that our current robots are operating in clean lab environments. Um, so we developed a few simulations, and we'll jump into these. There's a, a magnetic alignment model that helps us understand if we can array these magnets in such a way that we can build larger area robots. Um, there's a diamagnetic levitation model that helps us compute what forces we might see under different magnet designs. Um, and then there's a compliant robot model that lets us compute the impact of robot flexibility on our ability to levitate over curved surfaces like craters and hills without contacting the track. And the results of these models then inform our fabrication of some actual robots um, that we then have a series of, of experiments with. And, and we first demonstrate passive testing of both rigid and flexible robots. We then show we can actually do active control of both robots. Um, and then we finally look at dust clearing and some life cycle testing, very preliminary work, but just to see how they behave on dirty tracks. Now, I'll just do a quick overview of, of what these robots actually look like so that it's, it's clear when we get into some of the, the figures coming up. But our approach for building large area compliant robots is to start with actually small, rigid uh, magnetic robots, since that's what we have experience building and working with. And the idea is you take a set of permanent magnets and you, you can tile them together with alternating north and south poles pointing up, and you can build this large checkerboard array. Um, now, that's a large, rigid robot, but if you take these robots, these small magnet robots, and you pat uh, array them in the right pattern, you can actually have them basically sit near one another and, and repel one another, um, but we can then connect them with a series of compliant flexures that actually link them together. Um, and that allows us to assemble a larger area compliant robot. And then these larger area robots can support a greater net payload, and the engineered compliance will allow us to navigate over non-flat surfaces. So this is actually sitting in a little bowl, although it's a little hard to see because of the focus. Um, and we can do that despite having these very small levitation gaps. And for folks who've played with magnets before, you may be wondering, um, how can we keep multiple magnet arrays so close together and connected with only these little film flexures without having them all snap together in a giant mess? Um, and through a bit of clever engineering, we're able to achieve, again, passive stability through what we like to call a, a magnetic tensegrity structure. And what that is is that the, these individual magnets are all repelling one another, um, and then the, the flexures actually limit that ex that ability of them to move apart. So the, the inextensible compliant flexures keep everything in tension, um, and they provide out-of-plane compliance because they're very thin, so we can conform to our hills or craters, but they are stiffer to rotations or, or other uh, in-plane motion, 
which prevents the snap-through instabilities where all our magnets would, would jumble together in a big mess. And so having sort of explained all that, this is the model that kind of shows this. Um, and so to identify these correct magnetic configurations, we, we built this magnetic alignment model where you have two robots, and you'll notice that north up or south up is, is colored differently. Um, and you can see that the, the two robots are basically mirror images of one another in this configuration. And we can then compute the, the force between these two micro robots in each of these four by four checkerboard uh, micro robots. And the, the color shown here is the intensity of the attractive or repulsive force. And the uh, little vectors show which direction that force is acting on robot two relative to robot one. So if the lines are pointing away, we get repulsion. If they're pointing towards the robot, we're getting attraction. Um, and so what you see is that as we have a, a smaller separation gap, the repulsive or attractive force goes up. Um, and if we're really close to each other, you can see that these, these vectors change very quickly. And that's basically as you alternate having north and south magnets aligned with one another as they move past each other. So what we did find is that if you have these robots separated by about three of these little unit magnet widths apart or greater, um, the alternating magnet fields start to cancel out in the far field, and you basically will get just a pretty consistent net repulsive or attractive force. And so that's where we want to build these robots. Um, and what we also found is that these results will remain consistent for larger area robots um, with the same magnet sizes because only the magnets on the perimeter really affect the interaction between adjacent robots. Um, this also extrapolates for, for patterning more than just two robots. So as long as you maintain this kind of grid of robots, you can have as many of them as you want in the plane. Now, we also built this diamagnetic levitation model that allows us to estimate the, the pressure of the levitation at various gaps um, and for checkerboard magnet arrays with various uh, magnet sizes. So if I have a, a single magnet unit that looks like that, um, we can, uh, and the, the dimensions are shown here, we can double the, air, uh, the height to make it thicker. Uh, we can also double the area shown here. Um, so that's a two millimeter squared area instead of a one millimeter squared area. Uh, we can do both. And you don't need to, to view too much other than to see that there, there are different curves that basically show what our levitation pressure is um, in each of these different configurations. Um, and what we normally work with are, are down here. And they're actually the, the lowest of the pressures of these different configurations we checked out. Um, but what we observe is that we can actually generate greater pressure, levitation pressure, and thus carry more payload um, if we make the magnets thicker, and then if we actually shrink the area of the magnets. Um, and we also found that if we increase the thickness of the graphite plate that sits under the robot that, that generates that levitation force, um, as we increase its thickness up to a certain point, we actually get more pressure, levitation pressure as well. Um, so those are all you know, very useful initial results that help us understand how much payload we can carry on the moon. Um, we then wanted to understand, you know, can these robots conform to non-flat surfaces? And so using those levitation results of the prior simulation, we also built a, a finite element model that let us basically confirm that, that flexible robots can conform uh, at both centimeter and meter scales to craters and hills with different curvature. And so we have two examples here. This is a uh, centimeter scale robot or that is also gonna be in some of the, the subsequent slides. I mean, this is a meter scale robot here with, with 10 segments, and each of the magnet segments are shown in, in green, and the, the compliant flexures are shown in blue, and the track is in orange. Um, and what you can see here is that in both cases, we, we can basically find solutions where we have levitation with a gap from over the track uh, on, using these different compliant robots. Um, and they also help us identify some design considerations when we want to do these kind of multi-segmented, much more complex robots. And what we can see at number one here is that we maximize our levitation gap, and that's, that's what the color bar shows here. We maximize our, our levitation gap when we have very small flexures. And that's because flexures add mass, but they provide no levitation force. Um, but we also have a region down here where if we have very small magnet sections or a higher percentage of, of flexures to magnets, we can actually fully bottoming, prevent ourselves from fully bottoming out on the track even when we go to very tight radius of curvature. So if we start to understand how well we can manufacture flat or non-flat tracks on the moon, that can give us some guidance on, on what these kind of robots need to look like, how much of them are flexure, how much of them are, are magnets, and, and how small they need to be. 
Um, I'll also briefly just mention this because I think it's really compelling, but not super uh, uh, pretty in, in graph form, um, is that we looked at, at how much energy it takes to, to move stuff on the moon. So that's called cost of transport or power of transport. Um, and we compared a rover. We actually just used some numbers we had from the, the Curiosity rover uh, for, for how much energy it takes to drive on Mars um, as just a, a baseline estimate. But, um, but understood um, if we had a robot carrying equivalent mass, either with a, with a rover or a fleet of float robots, um, how much you know, power would it require and what would that cost of transport look like on different slopes? And what we see here is that we actually get um, multiple potentially orders of magnitude reduction in our cost of transport using float. And that's really just because you're, you're levitating these robots, so you have very little friction. and All your power is going into just pushing them up and down hills, um, whereas a wheeled vehicle has to contend with all of these interactions with the terrain. And the last thing I'll say is also, we don't have to carry any other electronics on board, right? These robots are, are just magnets, and they, all of the controls is actually on the track and off the robots. So you're not carrying any excessive uh, stuff on your robots. So um, you know, I've talked a lot, shown, shown simulations, but let's, let's get into some, some experiments. So now that, now that we know these are fundamentally feasible concepts, we built and tested a few prototypes. Um, and we, we started with a graphite bowl, shown here. Um, and we built a, a rigid robot that's about 15 millimeters long. And you can see here, it's not levitating, right? Um, but we add one degree of compliance. So it's the exact same length, but there's now a compliant beam in the middle. Um, and now we levitate in that bowl. And then we took our design and we built our 2D compliant robot and you have levitation in a bowl. And it's, you know, it's again, it's on the you know, 1.5 centimeter scale. It's, it's still small, but it's a, it's a proof of concept that this works. And these robots are all actually the same length. We're just taking out three magnets and replacing with a compliant flex shape. Now, uh, the next thing we did was we wanted to do our, a passive test. Um, so we're going to allow these robots to passively slide down an inclined plate uh, with a crater in it. And a very tiny two by two uh, magnet robot will go right through it. But as soon as you're up to the same larger size scale, you're going to get stuck. Um, but we can have our equal length compliant robot and it goes right through. So this is you know, the first proof of concept that you know, we can handle non-flat terrain. Um, that's exactly what we're hoping to see. The next step though is can we control these uh, robots? Now that they're compliant, it actually gets quite a bit cha more challenging than if you have a rigid robot where you know where every magnet actually is. Um, and so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually carve a crater um, and it's a little hard to see, so I've tried to highlight it here, into a half millimeter thick sheet of graphite. And so there's, there's a graphite sheet here, there's another graphite plate here, and then underneath that are the control electronics that we use that I talked about before um, to, to controllably move these magnets over a surface. Um, and there's actually a through hole where we actually cut through that top graphite plate, so that's how you really know that there's a, there's a, a bowl cut into this. Um, and you'll see we, we started by driving this exact same uh, size robot, uh, so it's an eight by eight magnet grid, um, and we started driving in it, and you see, you know, we're trying our best and it's just getting stuck. <laughs> um, and, and then we, you know, with a little trial and error, we're able to, to get controllable motion. Um, and we demonstrate both 2D motion, uh, which is something you'll definitely need if you're on the moon doing sort of a, a large network of tracks. Um, and we also get repeatable motion in and out of these bowls, which was something else we really wanted to understand. So we can transition from a flat surface to a curved bowl and back. All right, um, we also then wanted to think about you know, dust and abrasion. And so the, we did a two-step process here to study the impact of, of a, a regular simulant on micro-robotic operation. And I'll admit that both of these are using rigid robots to start with. Um, so doing compliant robot is, is still work to go. But we initially demonstrated that you can do some clearing of a surface that has this sort of simulated regolith uh, with the robot. You'll see it's, it's sticking quite a bit to the robot itself. So some of the future work is thinking about you know, what types of, of cleaning tools we can actually use to, to keep it from sticking to our robots. Um, but then we also you know, tried it with even more particles. And I'll let this keep playing out as I talk. But what we found is that if there are too many particles, you actually can jam everything up and, and have more resistance than you can generate thrust. And in that case, you lose position control of these robots um, and they kind of 
go off the page. Um, so you know, that, that shows some of the challenges that we'll face as we scale this system up and the reliability requirements we'll need for our system. But the next step was we actually did some, some life type book testing where we actually ran this thing for on the order of 53,000 cycles, drove this tiny robot on the order of, of 650 meters, and ran it for you know, 36 hours nearly continuously. Um, and what's really cool is we did this on a pre-cleared segment of the track. So we used that first robot to clear away most of the particles. Um, and any particles that were too small to be cleared away actually just stay underneath the levitated robot. And so that combination of pre-clearing and then putting a new robot on the track, uh, we saw no visible signs of wear between the, the initial and the final states. Um, and, and that's really great. That's, that's exactly what we're hoping to see. And this just sort of shows the video extraction and the distance accumulated of this, of this test. Um, now, in parallel, so as this is all working, we wanted to think about how this, you know, we focused on these very small robots. We want to think big again. How does this fit into a lunar-based system? Um, and so we, we developed a model that enabled us to properly size the, the capabilities we were simulating and measuring, um, extrapolate those to robot performance estimates for the different uh, mission concepts I discussed at the start of this presentation. And we considered three different track configurations. So we had uh, a simple out and back approach with pull-offs so robots can pass each other. We had a, a two and three parallel track configurations that, you know, in this case, you can do maintenance on one track while you're, you're running 24-7 on the moon. Um, and we then sort of did some calculations to, to understand, you know, how many robots will we need if we have different speed or payload capabilities? And, and you can see the, the numbers run from kind of hundreds to thousands, depending on, on how well these work. Um, and I'll also mention, you know, tests in lab show we can go about half a meter per second, or about two kilometers an hour with these robots. We think we can go faster. A lot of them on Earth experience air damping, so when you get onto the moon, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then it's just a control problem. Can you control these robots on the tracks quickly enough? Um, also, just to add that the, the bottom plot here um, gives us an estimate of, of what the total system mass might look like based on the distance we need to go and how fast these robots can go, which is kind of a stand-in for, for, for how many robots. Um, and what you can see here is that you know, they're both drivers, but that the, the track distance is really the dominating factor and that, that the mass of our system is, is heavily dependent on, on just how far we're traveling, but I'll note that you know we're looking at total system mass in the tens of tons range, which is a lot at first. But when you realize and, and look at some of the potential lunar lander systems, that you could transport an entire float system to the moon in a single launch, which is um, at that point kind of a compelling argument. And, and maybe we need the SpaceX uh, big rocket, but but it's doable with a single launch, which is something that you might not be able to do with a railroad system, for example. And finally, you know, we started thinking about, you know, what might these look like? Um, so, so it's still early stages, but we wanted to come up with some concepts for how we would deploy float um, and retrieve it. And what's shown here uh, is a, uh, a system that uses some modular components uh, from other NASA and JPL lunar robot studies called NextGen. Um, but the initial site preparation would, would need to be done uh, to smooth the lunar surface and remove large rocks or boulders, but we're not trying to pave a flat surface. Um, and then the, the next step is, is using a robot that can deploy rolls of track uh, using a series of, of articulating conveyor belts and a, and a set of robotic arms. Um, and the system, we, we designed it so that you could actually do it in reverse, so you could pick up segments of track that get damaged and, and ma do maintenance or repair or, or replacement on them. Um, and then shown up here is, is a sample, you know, one meter square uh, float robot with regolith trays um, on it um, that consist of actually 100 smaller magnet arrays, each uh, linked with these flexures that we were showing earlier. And then you have individual trays that sit on top of each one. And by doing this, we allow our robots to maintain that compliance we were trying to design in. Um, but we also basically prevent the regolith from falling out as we go up uh, slopes or into craters. And you know, I'll finish the section on float by just mentioning where we want to go next. And, and the next steps are, are looking at scaling this up. So as you go to 10 or 100x scale, what we currently have, it's really important to think about how we can do automated manufacturing of these large area robots. That's not something that's ever been done before. Um, so how do we assemble them and how do we control them? Um, and then also, again, start to explore the endurance and particle clearing and abrasion testing uh, with the flexible robots. 
and start developing some new and expanded capabilities, um, including regolith transport on these microrobots on Earth, um, doing load sharing among multiple microrobots, and developing some dedicated tools for track clearing. And, and these little videos here showed that. I, I love this one. This is a Mobius strip, in case folks didn't notice. Um, so it's, it's actually one dimensional. Uh, and so the robots are just sent around, and they keep looping around both sides. And I thought that was a really cool little demo um, that our collaborators at SRI had made years ago, but, but I think it's really cool. Um, so again, these are my colleagues. Um, had a great team, um, a lot of fun. And with that, we're going to jump into something totally different, swim. <laughs> um, and that is sensing with independent microswimmers. And it's a collaboration uh, between folks at JPL and Georgia Tech. Um, and we also actually presented some of this work uh, at the Astrobiology Science Conference uh, in May. So NASA, on a totally different side of the solar system, and through the Sesame and Cold Tech programs, has been exploring the viability of cryobots for ocean world mission concepts. And cryobots are robots that can deploy from a lander and then melt, drill, or otherwise tunnel through kilometers thick ice sheets to access the subsurface oceans. However, on reaching these ocean ice interfaces, the cryobots are relatively immobile, and that necessitates sampling ocean currents that flow by them rather than going out and searching on their own. And they generate significant amounts of heat, which affects the local environment that they're sampling. Um, and I've been told from the scientists that actually um, they're usually, so the, the melting component is usually the, the same sort of radioisotope power that powers the, the Perseverance rovers. Um, that generates so much thermal heat, like kilowatts of thermal heat, that you actually can create this superheated bubble of water around the cryobot once you're at the ocean. Um, and that's because the pressure under the ice is so high, the, the water actually can't boil. So you just create this superheated plume of water under the ice, which is really cool and something you never think about. Um, but that affects the samples that we're going to try to take in that water. Um, so what we want to do is we want to enhance these ocean access missions by enabling the cryobots to deploy hundreds, um, or maybe just dozens uh, of untethered, individually controllable swimming micro-robots that each have integrated sensing and communication. And the purpose of these micro-swimmers is to provide distributed, highly redundant sensing of the environmental habitability and potentially biomarkers in the oceans of Europa, Enceladus, or Titan at some distance from the cryobot. And that allows us to explore a more pristine ocean environment and greatly improves the, sal the sample provenance and opportunities for, for major discoveries, which we would see as you know, finding signs of life, um, or, or at least habitability. <laughs> um, and you know, these are very notional graphics initially because we really didn't know what those robots might look like. Right? We knew we wanted propulsion, sensing, and communication, but we weren't quite sure what robot would, would solve all those things for us. Um, and the challenge for that, and the challenge for ocean access missions in general, is that they're highly constrained by volume, shape, and reliability requirements for getting through that ice, for, for tunneling through the ice. But once you're in the ocean, the ocean exploration missions have to operate in unknown conditions that can potentially include high currents, turbid water, uh, a water ice slurry, even brinicles, which are these kind of uh, brine-filled stalactites. Um, and as a result, existing Sesame-class robots have streamlined bodies with limited in-ocean mobility and limited payload volume that's usually in the kind of tens of liter range. And they have very small diameters, about 25 centimeters. Um, most ocean exploration robots, a few shown here, um, like Orpheus and Brewery, they're roughly 10 times too large. And they have limited redundancy even at that point. Um, so our innovation with SWIM is to swap a single sophisticated meter scale robot for many simpler centimeter scale micro swimmers. And these microswimmers are, again, you probably getting used to hearing this, good enough to achieve our science goals, but with high redundancy, low volume, and very simple subsystems. Um, you know, inspiration for this came at a couple different size scales. There are these swimming blue swarm fish out of Harvard. Um, and they're, you know, we even thought about as small as these you know, micro 3D printed um, vibratory swimmers that used ultrasound to actually uh, generate thrust. Um, and so we, we, we were thinking quite a few different size scales. Um, now, the overarching goal for any ocean access mission, and, and we pull a lot of this uh, from, from the, the prime concept shown here, um, which was a, a sesame-style cryobot uh, that's been developed at JPL. Um, but, but our overarching goal for, for that mission and for SWIM is, is to explore these alien oceans and their interfaces, understand their habitability, and search for past or extant life. Um, and there are three real objectives for that. We want to search for a characterized life. 
We want to understand the chemical environment and processes, and we want to understand the physical environment and processes. Um, and, and scientists, um, both on SWIM and on PRIME, uh, and PRIME, for those who don't know, stands for the probe using radioisotopes for icy moon exploration, so we love our acronyms. Um, but, but folks on both teams have, have kind of divided these objectives into a number of different uh, investigations and sub-investigations that would be capable of being performed either uh, descending through the ice sheet or once anchored at the ocean ice, ocean ice interface. Um, and there's a large overlap between these two science investigations, but we're specifically focusing here on the deriving, uh, defining the investigations and deriving the measurements uh, and requirements that are uniquely enabled by these mobile micro-robots that are swimming freely in the ocean. And so in the context of this larger ocean access mission, we think SWIM can do three things for us. We think it enables the search for uh, and characterization of past or present microbiomes at this ice ocean interface by permitting close investigation of regions outside of the cryobot's immediate field of view. Um, we also can enhance the investigations of this interface by providing spatial and temporal information beyond the cryobot single reference point. Um, and that basically means if you have multiple robots swimming around and taking measurements at the same time, you can build up a, a more distributed model that evolves over time of what this environment looks like. Um, and then finally, SWIM provides some redundancy through both spatial and temporal investigations of the water column, um, both with the use of numerous robots, which we can deploy uh, in, in swarms across the mission timeline, as well as by using these robots to collect measurements in a different location from the cryobot. So, uh, and I'll try to speed up because I see it's already 545. Um, that said, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges working in this environment. Um, and it's, it's got some similarities with Earth, but there are a lot of differences. Um, and, and they present some engineering challenges. So on Europa, for example, we have to survive pressures that are 25 to 50 megapascals. And that's equivalent to, to operating under a few kilometers of water on Earth. Um, we also have to operate in ocean currents that are up to a meter per second. Um, and we need to do this while exploring and collecting data across about an 85-hour diurnal cycle because we want to understand if there are differences between uh, the ocean characteristics at, at high and low tide. Um, and our design is also going to be heavily restricted in the amount of data we can send back to Earth, um, as well as the payload volume we can use. So on these cryobots, you know, you're looking typically at you know, dozens uh, of liters of, of payload volume, and we're competing with space from, with all the other science instruments that scientists want to send. So given that, a single instrument is typically allocated about five liters of, of payload volume uh, under these concepts, we're striving to limit SWIM to a sing similar size scale. Um, and then finally, we'll just add that, that any mission to an ocean world takes an impressively long amount of time to get there. So in the case of, of Europa, it could take us anywhere from seven to 15 years from launch just to get to that ocean and start exploring. And so our robots need to survive and remain fully operational at that point. Um, and that starts to make us think about what systems are going to be the most reliable, robust, and have the fewest failure modes. So in, in our phase one work, which happened last year, we did quite a large trade study of lots of different system architectures. Um, and it was broken down uh, among so the robot structure, the sensing, the mobility, the communication, the power, and, and the computation or intelligence. And I also kind of reiterated up here what, what some of these environmental system integration and operational requirements are that we had to think about as we were trading all these different designs. Um, not going to go through them all now. We can talk about them in the Q&A. Um, but, but we're actually going to step through a few specific point designs that, that made different choices in these trades. Uh, the first of which is, is a dragon kite concept. Um, the idea here was actually you had three identical kites. They can be packed up inside the cryobot. Um, in that five liter volume, and you basically deploy them out. They're all connected by a tether, um, and they each have sort of 11 sensing nodes. Each node has its own independent steering, and that allows them to basically, they're all going to operate downstream because they have no propulsion, but they can actually sort of operate in this big cone downstream rather than just being purely downstream of that robot, uh, the cryobot, in that big thermal bubble we're worried about. Um, each robot has a few different uh, sensor instruments. So they have a, an ocean composition sensor and then one larger system like a camera uh, or sample analysis. Um, our second candidate design was what we called the twister pod concept. And that was inspired by the movie Twister. Folks have seen that uh, a couple decades ago. Um, but it consists of, of three tethered robots um, that use active motor propulsion 
to navigate to sites of interest. And then they can deploy uh, internal to there these small uh, passive floating sensor pods. And each pod has a predefined buoyancy um, and, and sensor payload. And then an ultrasound communication puck that allows us to relay data back for either a kilometer of range or about an hour, whichever comes first. But each of those had their pros and cons. And, and we eventually selected and, and are working now uh, in phase two on a, a delta wing concept that consists of 60 to 75 centimeter cube robots, each with this kind of wedge-shaped streamlined body that per per permits efficient packing in a cylinder. Um, and each robot is designed to have propulsion that's sufficient for uh, two meters per second velocity, um, so about 100% margin of, of safety on what we think the ocean might look like. Um, we have sensing with a, a co-packaged MEMS ocean composition sensor. We have two-way communication with the cryobot with an ultrasound transducer that gets us a kilometer of range. Um, and we use a, a primary non-rechargeable battery that'll give us a, a little less than two hours uh, of power 15 years into the mission uh, without recharging. Um, and this system is not actually designed with a pressure vessel. That's a, that adds a lot of mass. Um, and what we actually intend is that all the components are either pressure rated, and the ones that are sensitive to water are, are basically made waterproof by potting, but we're not actually trying to, to, to have air or oil inside this system. And I'll just add that, you know, I didn't really talk too much about it, and I won't in this, in this talk right now, but, but these robots are actually negatively buoyant. So, so at the end of the mission, they'll just sink, and they'll sink to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so that raises a lot of planetary protection concerns. Uh, that are very relevant, and we don't dive into them too much in phase one, but it's something we're going to start thinking about more and more in phase two. Um, and so making sure these systems don't bring life with you and, and don't provide a, a power source for life to grow after you're gone is very important. Um, so I also have backup slides on all the different subsystems. We can talk about it later if folks are interested. Um, but I'll sort of now step forward and say that, well, now that we have this sort of robot concept, let's think about how we might deploy them, how we might package them, um, what's really cool here and what's really compelling about this design is we can fit 48 robots uh, into this sort of notional five liter payload volume. Um, and they're packed radially in, in six layers of, of eight robots. And um, you can come up later. Actually, just yesterday and today, we, we printed a few of them out to see what they might look like. And, you know, they really are tiny. And, you know, uh, you know we're not going to be building quite at this scale with our initial prototypes, but, but this is where we'd like to get to eventually. Um, and it may seem crazy, but you know you have small little quadcopter drones that are that are even smaller than this today that you can you can play with and buy uh, right now. So you know we're we're trying to think about how you can do that with swimming robots. Um, and so when you have 48 of them, you can pack them in quite nicely. Um, they would actually remain unpressurized during the whole cruise and descent to the ocean, and then we need to basically drop away an external panel, and you'd have your robots rotate into position, reverse out, and then swim away. Um, and you know, this also, I just like, really think it, it highlights the advantage of swim, which is that we're, we're very agnostic to the mother craft that we use. So this little cylinder of robots can really be scaled in quantity and size and dimension to match whatever payload volume you have in almost any mission to an ocean world. So we'd you know, love to go to, to add on to a Titan drone or boat, um, you could go to ice probes for subglacial exploration on Earth in the future. You know, there are a lot of different ways you might be able to use these. And then we start to think about the concept of operations. So it, once you deploy them, you know, how might you use them? And, and shown here are two complementary exploration techniques where the swim robots are going to navigate away from the, the cryobot, and then they proceed to collect measurements and build up a 2D or 3D profile of the water column at this uh, ice-ocean interface. And we can do that by sort of doing these kind of cyclic patterns in the, in the water, but also if we notice that there's some interesting chemical or temperature or, or, or other gradient um, in the water, we can have specific robots do kind of gradient tracking uh, maneuvers to actually look for the source of those signals. Um, and throughout the entire time, we're, we're planning to relay the data back to the mother craft using ultrasound, which works very well in water. Um, and that ensures successful exploration isn't contingent on having these robots swim back and download their data at the mother craft. So even if you lose them you know, a kilometer away, you still are getting data back that whole time that they're out exploring. Um, and we also, and I'll just start this going, we also started to think about what various control approaches we might have that can maximize the science return. 
um, of a swarm of these untethered robots. And they all have limited perception. So this is getting back to the, the very limited capabilities of these robots. They don't have a lot of onboard sensing and computation. Um, and so you may also not have an a priori map of your environment. Um, and it's very dark unless you bring a light. There's a lot of challenges for, for you know, vision-based navigation and so forth. Um, so shown here is, is one option for how you might get a cluster of robots to move together with flocking. Uh, they can maintain rough proximity to one another with very little information about the, the relation between the robots. But it allows us, and, and these colors that they're collecting here basically are, are correlated with depth, uh, but there's, you know, that's, that's pressure. Um, and, and in this case, it allows multiple samples to be collected in a relatively coordinated region, um, which reduces our per robot sensor error and improves our signal gradient detection at the cost of some ex increased exploration time to explore the full volume we're trying to look through. And we have less sensitivity to transient signals that might be in the water. Um, but you can think about if you're 15 years into mission, how you recalibrate your sensors is very challenging. And so if you have multiple robots that can combine their measurements, that can actually help reduce your error and improve your kind of uh, confidence in what you're measuring. Um, we'll also just mention, you know, there's another approach. If you have a swarm of robots, you can look for a coverage-based uh, sort of repulsion strategy where robots basically just maneuver to avoid other robots. And this minimizes our time to explore a large volume. Um, and it increases our sensitivity to these transient signals that might exist there. The cost of that, though, is you don't get a lot of resampling, and, and you have those per robot measurement errors to, to think about. Um, and, and I'll just sort of show here, you know, with these two different exploration strategies, um, you have different speeds at exploring the whole volume that we've set up. In this case, it was kind of a 100 meter cubic volume. Um, but it really does capture the trade offs that we see between our different strategies for autonomous exploration. And you know, I'll just reiterate, this is very much autonomous. Um, you have hours of one-way communication to these robots and very low data rates. So all of this is going to have to be done with the onboard capabilities of these robots and the cryobot itself. Um, and so you know, I'll just very briefly touch on the future work. Um, we, we're, we're fortunate enough to be selected for phase two funding earlier this year. And that's going to let us actually build some prototypes uh, and mature the concept further. Um, so our work for the next two years is really focused on developing the relevant subsystems, um, either with, with COTS, so commercial components, or fabricating them in-house. And we're, we're striving for order of magnitude correctness um, and demonstrating kind of necessary capabilities. Um, the, the really kind of key ones are, are sensing with these different measurement uh, signals we want, showing propulsion and steering work with waterproof actuators, but the size um, doing active control is going to be challenging, and, and demoing a, a small ultrasound communication system is going to be really critical to, to show that this concept is viable. Um, and our initial work we expect will be on the order of kind of two to three times larger than we want in the end, um, and that's just because we don't have the, the ability to do full tech development of every subsystem we want. So we're really just trying to show fundamental feasibility of this concept as small as we can get it. Um, and then we, we kind of methodically want to integrate all these systems build some actual integrated robots, test them in a water tank, um, and start uh, exploring what new challenges arise once you have real hardware to work with. Um, it's going to be fun. Uh, and, and we'll also be doing some continued simulations to look at, at how we do this swarm control and how, when things start to fail, you can have your system autonomously recover. Uh, again, I don't do this work on my own. I have a, a huge, very diverse, great team. Um, in these roles, I'm really the system engineer trying to pull together expertise from a lot of different s folks. Um, and, and having a great team really helps with that. Um, so, you know, that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed that talk and happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs>